Good afternoon. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the Executive Director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I'd like to welcome you all to our weekly webinar series on the medical and public health considerations of COVID-19. Today, we have a very special and, and timely uh, presentation um, on a topic of interest to many of us, which is pregnancy in the time of COVID-19. Next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners for uh, helping to get out the word about our, our webinars. Next slide. Uh, this webinar, uh, as well as our previously uh, um, um, our previous webinars have all been uh, put onto uh, our website at acmt.net forward slash COVID-19 uh, web. And today's webinar uh, will be recorded and will be uh, put onto the platform uh, in about two days. Next slide. Uh, there, there will be a, a Q&A at the end of the webinar. This is a, a, a big feature of our webinars and generally this goes on for you know 15 or 20 minutes sometimes. And, and please type your questions into the Q&A function uh, during the webinar uh, or into the chat function and we'll get to as many uh, of the questions as possible. We monitor uh, all the platforms in, including YouTube as well. Next slide. Um, we've also uh, developed a series of FAQs based on a, a number of our webinars. This can also be found on our website. Uh, the most recent uh, update was about uh, uh, influenza testing in the setting of COVID-19. Next slide. Um, our speaker today does not have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, co-moderator of the series, Dr. Ziad Kazi. Dr. Kazi is a board member of the American College of Medical Toxicology and president of the Middle East and North African Clinical Toxicology Association and an associate professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology at Emory University. Next slide. It's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce our guest moderator today. Uh, our guest moderator is, is Dr. Mara Zlotnik. Uh, she's the Associate Fellowship Director and Clinical Professor in the Division of Maternal and Fetal Medicine in the Department of OBGYN and Reproductive Sciences at the University of San Francisco, um, UCSF in San Francisco. And she'll be helping out with the moderation uh, of the Q&A uh, toward the end of, of the webinar today. At this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kazi uh, for, uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Wax. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a very important topic that we've been meaning to bring to you uh, for uh, several months. And um, we have an excellent uh, speaker today to update us on this very important topic. Dr. Denise Jameson is the James Robert McCord Professor and Chair of the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Jameson has a uh, uh, tremendous amount of experience, clinical work with the, our pregnant uh, uh, population as well as experience in emergency preparedness and public health through her work at the CDC. Dr. Jamison uh, completed a fellowship in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at CDC and worked at CDC for 20 years in maternal health and emergency preparedness. She has most recently been uh, appointed to the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Jamison is going to discuss a broad uh, number of questions related to pregnant women and COVID-19. Dr. Jamison. Um, thank you very much. I um, appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, before I started, I also just wanted to thank my long-term friend and collaborator, Dr. Rasmussen. We have worked uh, together on many infectious disease and pregnancy issues for uh, more than two decades now. And what I'm going to present today really re represents our joint thinking on this topic. So I'm going to ask a series of questions and then present the evidence um, to help answer those questions. And the first question is, are pregnant persons more like more susceptible to becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2? Are they more likely um, uh, to acquire COVID-19? And the answer is, we don't know. We know um, what the prevalence in certain pregnant populations are during certain periods of time because we instituted universal screening of pregnant persons presenting to labor and delivery at many of our sites. And these are a, um, um, a number of different published reports um, that demonstrate that the seroprevalence uh, can be quite high, or the prevalence rather can be quite high, um, up to 20% in some settings such as New York. However, we do not have a comparison group we're not doing universal screening of other populations, so it's very hard to say whether pregnant women are more or less likely um, to acquire uh, COVID. 
second question is how do race and ethnicity and other factors affect um, SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy? This was a nice um, analysis that looked at prevalence rates of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection um, by different characteristics. And they showed that, in fact, and this is in New York City, they showed that infection was um, less likely among persons living in buildings with higher mean assessed values, building with more residential units, um, neighborhoods with higher income, um, and it was more likely in neighborhoods with high unemployment, large households, um, and more crowding. This was an analysis that we did here um, at Emory, and we have two hospitals that are less than a mile away, yet have very different patient populations. Um, Grady is our hospital that serves largely an underserved um, population, all Medicaid or uninsured, mostly almost nearly all uh, Medicaid and uninsured patients. Um, and the prevalence there was 9.4%. At the same time, we measured the prevalence at Emory University Hospital Midtown, which is primarily an insured population, um, and the prevalence was 1.5%. Infection was also significantly associated with Hispanic ethnicity, uninsured status, high neighborhood density, and paradoxically, smaller household size, which is not what we would have expected. Um, can't really explain that, but for the most part, um, um, infection was associated, associated with um, um, more crowding and uh, lower socioeconomic status. So the next question that comes up are, are pregnant persons with COVID at increased risk of severe disease compared to non-pregnant persons? And the answer here is basically yes. So these are the best data. This is an updated report from the CDC case report, uh, case surveillance system. And it looked at um, pregnant persons with COVID compared to non-pregnant patients with COVID and found that pregnant persons were more likely to be admitted to the ICU, require mechanical ventilation, require ECMO and die compared to non-pregnant persons. And that was after adjustment for important covariates, age, race, um, and medical conditions. Similarly, um, uh, or I should say this is um, similar to, to non-pregnant patients. We also know that pregnant patients with comorbidities are more likely to have um, severe disease. So this was a prospective population-based cohort study from the United Kingdom. And it was a very nicely done surveillance system. They actually set it up in 2012 in anticipation of a respiratory pandemic. And then they didn't activate it until COVID. So they had done a lot of the groundwork for their surveillance system prior to COVID. Um, and they, this was a report um, that they published in June on 427 pregnant persons. And what they found was risk factors for severe disease defined as hospitalization, which isn't perfect, but it's a measure of severe disease, that um, patients who were black, older, and overweight or obese were more likely to require hospitalization. The other thing that I wanted to point about about symptomatology, this is a, um, a registry that was set up and led by UCSF. Um, this is a nationwide prospective cohort study of pregnant persons in the US um, called Priority. And an interesting finding from this report is that a quarter of symptomatic participants, pregnant uh, participants who are positive for SARS-CoV-2 had persistent symptoms eight or more weeks after symptom onset, um, which is certainly concerning. So now I wanna shift and talk a little bit about pregnancy outcomes. Does COVID-19 affect pregnancy outcomes? So if you think about infections in pregnancies, pregnancy and the effects on the embryo or fetus, you can have direct effects of the pathogen on the fetus. So in cases where the pathogen is um, transmitted uh, intrauterine or in utero, things like Zika, you can have direct effects on the fetus, but it's also possible to have secondary effects due to maternal illness. 
So for example, we know from our experience with pandemic influenza in 2009, persons with severe um, illness um, were more likely to deliver preterm infants, low birth weight infants, and infants with low APGAR scores. So severely ill uh, pregnant women deliver, um, are more likely to have a preterm birth, for example. So what does it look like with SARS-CoV-2 infection? Is maternal COVID-19 associated with preterm birth? These are a number of studies. Um, some of them show an increased risk. Some of them don't show a risk, but I think taken as a whole, there's probably an increased risk of preterm birth. And this is from a systematic review of 30 reports that was published um, as, a, as a living systematic review. So um, it's supposed to be continuously updated, um, published in British Medical Journal. And this did show that there was an increased risk of preterm birth at 17% among COVID positive um, compared to um, those uh, without COVID. It was a threefold increase, a, an odds ratio rather of three. Now, whether this is due to direct effects of the infection or maternal illness or even iatrogenic is not entirely clear, but they're taken in whole, there does seem to be a suggestion that there's an increased risk in preterm birth. What about stillbirth? Stillbirth is even harder to, um, it, it's less, luckily less common, harder to study. There might be some suggestion of an increased risk of stillbirth. Um, this, that UK system that I, surveillance system that I mentioned before, um, they found that um, during COVID, um, among COVID positive, there was an increase, there was 12.1 per 1,000 stillbirths compared to their national baseline rate of four to five. Um, for one hospital, there was a report in JAMA of um, uh, 9.3 during the pandemic period and 2.4 prior to the pandemic. Um, although these both su suggest that there may be an increased risk of stillbirth, I think the jury's still out and it is not entirely clear. So in the press, there's been um, also a lot of um, talk around um, overall preterm births um, during COVID lockdowns. And there have been some stories about, you know, where are all the babies in the NICU uh, during this period of time? And is there a decrease in overall preterm births, not among COVID infection, infected, but among all births? Um, and it's remarkable that in Ireland, Denmark, and Netherlands, there does seem to have been a rather dramatic decrease in preterm births. Um, and the differences are mostly due to a reduction in the extreme uh, prematurity. And people have postulated, you know, is this due to decreased stress or increased family support or infection of avoiding other infections, um, getting better sleep, having better nutrition, decreased stress, decreased exposure to air pollutants, um, avoidance of financial strain in these settings, which are, seem to me to be very different than the United States and the stress that we're all seeing from COVID lockdowns. Um, but it's really interesting because the causes of preterm birth have been elusive for decades. And if we could really figure out a way to prevent preterm births, that would be remarkable. Um, the bad news is that when we look at the preterm birth rate, there was a report from two um, Penn hospitals pre-pandemic versus um, pandemic periods, there was no change noted in the United States. So very interesting. I have no idea what this um, means. So the next question, let's talk about, is there intrauterine, intrapartum, or postnatal transmission of SARS-CoV-2? And the answer here is probably yes and probably. So various um, systems have been proposed to determine whether or not intrauterine transmission, um, transplacental transmission occurs. Um, I like these Blumberg criteria, which basically say the mom's positive, there's evidence of early exposure, and then there's persistence um, of infection. Um, there are different um, uh, sets of criteria that have been proposed. WHO is also working. Um, and proposing a, a set of criteria that I hope uh, we will adopt. So there are cases in the literature that meet the Blumberg criteria 
and seem to be possible or probable cases. I won't go through the details of these, but this is one. And this is another that I feel is one of the more compelling um, instances where it seems as though intrauterine transmission occurred. This was a mother who had a cesarean delivery. The membranes were intact. The amniotic fluid was PCR positive. The placenta was positive. The neonate was resuscitated, intubated, and isolated, so no contact with the mother. The neonatal blood and, bron and bronchoalveolar lavage fluid was PCR positive. The um, neonatal um, nasopharyngeal and rectal swabs were persistently positive. The neonate had symptoms um, and then gradually recovered. So to me, this is a probable case, and there are maybe 10 to 15 cases in the literature um, that seem fairly compelling. The next question is, can it be transmitted through breast milk? So there have been numerous papers that test breast milk from infected mothers and there's no, uh, no they are PCR negative. There was a um, case series with 18 um, pregnant persons, 64 samples collected, only one of them was PCR positive and there was no replication competent uh, virus detected in the milk. However, so that would seem to indicate that it, if it gets into the milk, it doesn't get in uh, very efficiently, um, if at all. This was a case report where a mother had mild symptoms. She was breastfeeding. Per the report, she wore a surgical mask and used very careful hand and breast hygiene. So it was unlikely to be contamination. The breast milk was tested seven times um, and was PCR positive on four consecutive days. The timing um, lined up so the baby developed symptoms and tested positive um, for both SARS-CoV-2 and RSV. So possibly this was infection. Uh, the baby very likely could have gotten um, infected from uh, maternal contact or any other contact as well. So taken as a whole, is it possible maybe that you can get the breast uh, feeding transmission, but this uh, study was very reassuring. This was an observ observational cohort of 116 COVID positive mothers in New York City. All the moms breastfed, um, including using a surgical mask, careful hand and breast hygiene. All the infants roomed in with the mothers and all the neonates were negative. So I think in terms of our messaging about, you know, is it safe to breastfeed? Um, I think the answer is the risks uh, the benefits of breastfeeding probably outweigh any small risks of transmission. So the next question I'm going to move on to is vaccines. Can pregnant persons receive mRNA vaccines? Um, and obviously um, the past few weeks have been very busy with um, uh, lots of um, developments in the vaccine front. So I was just going to review what happens normally in terms of um, vaccine approval. So in general, you have these preclinical studies um, uh, that are performed. Uh, these include for vaccines used in pregnancy, these include DART or developmental and reproductive toxicology studies. Then the, um, uh, you would apply for an IND. Uh, um, uh, an in investigational new drug application. And then there are phases of clinical trials. People talk about phase one, two, and three. Phase one is primarily safety, two is effectiveness. Phase three is safety and effectiveness. These can sometimes be combined. And then once you have enough, you being the manufacturer has enough information, a BLA is submitted, which is a um, biological license application or an application for, application for full um, licensing of the product, the vaccine. That's reviewed by the FDA. The FDA would approve the new vaccine. And then the ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee um, on Immunization Practices, it's an advisory committee to the CDC. They would meet, make a determination. Once they determine that the vaccine, um, basically they determine um, how the licensed vaccine, who gets the licensed vaccine and how, um, and they would make their recommendation to the CDC director. Um, and then it would be approved for use. And then there would be phase four is the post-approval monitoring and research. 
So um, that's the full licensing. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, were there shortcuts for um, approving this vaccine under an EUA? So I wanted to explain a little bit about the process and explain why I think um, that there, it wasn't a shortcut. I think it was a responsible, thoughtful, careful way of evaluating information quickly um, and ensuring that the product that's available is safe, the products hopefully that are available are safe and effective. So the steps, um, and I'm gonna specifically comment on what the process was for pregnant persons um, and the, vac the mRNA vaccine. So first you have the DSMB, I have all the acronyms here because I realize there are tons of them, which is this Data and Safety Monitoring Board um, is composed of independent scientists who periodically review phase three clinical trial results. So they look at the data and say, oh, we have enough outcomes, um, we're gonna stop the trial or we're gonna continue the trial, but we're gonna release the, we're gonna apply for an EUA. An EUA is an emergency use authorization that's submitted to the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and this is the authority that's provided to the FDA to allow medical products to be used in a public health emergency. And with this, um, these vaccines in particular, the FDA set higher standards for the vaccines given that they would be used on large populations of healthy people. So they actually said, yeah, you need phase three trials before we'll, we'll consider your EUA. Data are then reviewed by career scientists. So the, the regular staff at FDA who have tremendous expertise in this area. And then it's reviewed by VRPAC. VRPAC is the Vaccines and Related Biologic Project Products Advisory Committee. VRPAC is um, an independent committee to the FDA and it provides sort of an independent look at the data. Um, and that's done before uh, FDA approves the EUA, which is what happened is it last week, last week now. Once the EUA, so the FDA met on, I forget if it was Thursday or Friday, I think it was Thursday, and they're meeting again tomorrow for, about the Moderna vaccine. Once that happened, then the ACIP had an emergency meeting. The ACIP, as I mentioned, is that advisory committee that advises CDC, it's an independent committee. It reviews the EA, EUA and provides recommendations for how to use the vaccine for populations to be vaccinated and makes a recommendation. Once they make their recommendation, it is approved by the CDC director. And then the next step that's really important is in our field is that professional organizations such as ACOG and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine issue guidance to help guide obstetric providers um, uh, in, vac in vaccination. So the ACIP met on Saturday. On Sunday, ACOG issued um, a practice advisory alerting obstetricians as to how to manage vaccines uh, in pregnancy. And then on Monday, the first pregnant women started getting vaccinated in the US with the Pfizer vaccine. So very exciting. So how do mRNA vaccines work? mRNA vaccines, um, basically carry genetic information to manufacture the spike protein, the protein on the virus surface of SARS-CoV-2. It gets injected into the muscles. The cells manufacture the sp spike protein. Um, the spike protein is rec recognized by the immune system and the body uh, mounts an immune system. The mRNA is rapidly degraded. It has to be kept very cold um, because it's so unstable. Um, and so within days, uh, the mRNA is degraded. It's removed by the lymphatic system. It never enters the nucleus or is integrated into the cell DNA. So there's been some talk, you know, could the, could the vaccine, could the, um, um, you know, the nanoparticles with mRNA reach the placenta and uh, cross the placenta. But given how mRNA vaccines act locally, and are rapidly degraded and removed, it's very unlikely um, that the vaccine, but possible that the vaccine would reach and cross the placenta. And so that's been the major um, um, safety concern. So what do we actually know about mRNA vaccines in pregnancy? Well, um, Moderna, um, the manufacturer of the uh, vaccine that's being reviewed this week, um, released uh, um, preliminary results from developmental and reproductive toxicology studies from rats, basically showing, um, in, uh, showing no 
concerning effects, um, and FDA has looked carefully at these data. In addition, although pregnant persons were excluded from all the clinical trials, um, there were pregnant persons inadvertently enrolled in the clinical trials, which always happens um, for a variety of reasons. Um, there were 23 pregnancies in the Pfizer trial, 12 in the vaccine arm, and 13 in the Moderna trial, six in the vaccine arm. Um, I am hoping that the clinical and the manufacturers have indicated that their plan and intent is to start enrolling pregnant persons in mRNA vaccine trials, hopefully early this year. And then the other piece that I wanted to mention is safety monitoring. So there are a number of systems that are monitoring safety in all persons and specifically in pregnant persons. Um, and one of the exciting new developments is the CDC vSafe system, which if you've gotten, if you're lucky enough to have gotten your vaccine already, you should have been given information about CDC's vSafe. CDC's vSafe is a new phone-based vaccine tracker um, for monitoring um, uh, uh, side effects in vaccine recipients. You sign up on your cell phone um, and then you follow up um, and CDC follows up with you. And it, it, this vSafe system is specifically capturing information on pregnancy status um, and allows for follow-up of pregnant women. And I hear from my CDC colleagues that pregnant women are already, um, have already registered in this um, uh, system. So we should know more soon. So I mentioned that uh, ACOG, American College of OBGYNs, um, came out with a practice advisory on Sunday evening um, and this is what is recommended per ACOG. It also aligns nicely with Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. So people who should get the vaccine should be offered the vaccine regardless of their pregnancy status. Um, pregnant persons should be encouraged to talk with their obstetrician about their vaccination plan, but health systems should not require this for vaccination. We don't want there to be logistical barriers that limit access of pregnant women to get vaccine. And persons planning to become pregnant um, and are recommended to get vaccine should really complete their vaccination series prior to conception. It's just like any other vaccine. Before a woman gets pregnant, ideally we want to ensure that all her vaccinations are up to date. And I would argue in this day, um, having your COVID vaccine, if you're in a risk group, is, is high priority. So if you're not pregnant yet, get pregnant, uh, get vaccinated before pregnancy. Pregnancy testing should not be a requirement for vaccination. Again, we don't want to limit access unnecessarily. And there's no reason that lactating persons um, shouldn't be offered the vaccine. We give live measles, mumps, rubella vaccine to lactating women postpartum. And there is no reason why this vaccine shouldn't be offered to breastfeeding women. One caveat, you always wanna to remember to treat fever in pregnancy. Um, following vaccination, fever is common, although not as common as it seems to be. If you read the news, it's about 4% after the first dose and about 16% after the second dose in younger people. It's less common in older people. Um, since we know that fever in the first trimester can increase the risk of certain birth defects, you wanna treat the fever with acetaminophen, um, but you you should not be taking um, acetaminophen prophylactically for a couple of different reasons. So I think this is my last question and that is what should pregnant women do to avoid COVID? Well, pregnant women should really be doing what all of us should be doing, which is summarized as the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands and watch your distance. Avoid crowds, avoid COVID, um, do what you can and stay vigilant because um, you know, the end is near, is relatively near. And so um, you know, I think everyone is really fatigued and tired, but it's really important more than ever, and with the holidays coming up, that people be careful. I have two 14-year-old uh, twin boys um, who basically are, have driven me crazy for nine months because the poor kids are on Zoom all day and they're bored out of their skulls. And um, there's all sorts of things that they wanna be doing that they can't do. So rather than continuing to tell them all the things they can't do, I realized that I had to come up with a plan and come up with rules for what they could and couldn't do. Um, so we refer in our house to these uh, four uh, rules. 
And um, uh, every time they ask me something, I ask them what rule it falls under. I tried to make the first two positive because um, I got so tired of telling them no all the time. Um, and you know, these may not align exactly per perfectly with CDC or other guidance, but I tried to make it practical and I tried to focus on the things that were most important to them. Um, if you look at number three, I clarify eating, but only outside. I think inside eating is a huge problem and there's some data to support that. Um, there is nothing that says that eating six feet apart is safe, inside is safe. Um, and so I really tried to focus on staying outside. So in conclusion, um, no data on whether pregnant persons are more susceptible compared to non-pregnant. Race, ethnicity, insurance, and neighborhood factors affect whether a pregnant person is infected with SARS. Um, pregnant persons are more likely to have severe disease and the risk factors are similar in pregnant versus non-pregnant persons. Um, in terms of effects of COVID on the embryo or fetus, there is likely an increased risk of preterm birth, whether this is a direct effect of SARS, COVID-2, or an indirect effect is unclear. Not sure about stillbirth. I think really the jury's out. Um, I believe that intrauterine transmission occurs and has been documented, but it's not common. And pregnant persons can be safely offered the mRNA COVID vaccine. So thank you very much for your attention. I know I covered a lot of ground um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Dr. Jamison, that was so wonderful. Um, you uh, gave us a lot of really important and practical advice. And I think you answered a lot of people's questions that were typed into the chat as we went along, but we are still getting in lots of questions. Um, so I think the first question for you would be, there's a theme of um, what should women do approaching their due date? Should they quarantine for a certain amount of time when their due date is coming up? Um, how, how should they address sort of, you know, if they're following the rules that you've already laid out for us, what should they do when it, when they're coming up on their due date? So the question may be, so I think it depends on what you do and how you, what your options are to minimize your risk. So the questions that I get a lot of are healthcare providers, should a healthcare provider stop working? It's interesting because providing healthcare even in a COVID unit is not your biggest risk factor. Most transmissions occur in the community. And um, uh, furthermore, most of the transmissions that we've seen in healthcare systems have been in break rooms where people are eating. So I'm not sure. So I think that pregnant women approaching their due date should be vigilant about not getting COVID. Um, and I don't think that means that they have to stop working necessarily. I think they just keep doing what the same thing, same good things they should be doing throughout pregnancy. So I think you've just answered this question, but are there spe special precautions you'd recommend for frontline workers who are pregnant, you know, as far as PPE or, or other things? I would recommend doing exactly what you normally do with um, for PPE and to do it correctly and consistently. This is not a you know, super transmissible um, pathogen. We know how to protect ourselves. We just have to do it consistently and correctly and realize that most of the transmissions now are occurring in the, are occurring in the community and mostly in households. So um, that's the major, that is the major problem. And just uh, the question, the issue about PPE. PPE is really interesting because um, there's an undocumented story, and I have tried very hard. Unfortunately, the people involved in the story I've talked directly to, but I've never, they've never written it up. But basically, and it's been a while since I thought about this, so I might get it wrong, but um, in Texas, there was a Ebola transmission um, of two healthcare workers. And at the hospital, the, um, actually it wasn't the, the index patient came in no one knew for sure that the patient had Ebola, came into the emergency room and was taken care of by several emergency room nurses who were veterans, who knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't know they were dealing with Ebola, but they took appropriate precautions. And at the time, in retrospect, the patient had was highly viremic, so highly infectious. 
He then went from the emergency room up to the ICU, um, now diagnosed with Ebola. And the um, two junior nurses who were just out of, you know, who had not had that much experience, took care of him um, and made alterations to their PPE. So if one pair of gloves was good, they thought two was better and they taped the gloves and made other alterations to, to their PPE, thinking that they would be more safe and they got infected. And so what I took away from that story is do what you do, it's like condom use, do what you do consistently and correctly and don't make alterations and don't change what you do, just do it, you know, do it the way you should be doing it. Wonderful, and, thank you. And as just an editorial aside, because now I don't work for the federal government and I can say any crazy thing I want, is that um, uh, uh, COVID is a lot like a sexually transmitted disease. I mean, it's the same, you know, who you spend, who you eat with, you're also eating with all the people that they ate with previously. You're taking on the risks of that person plus a whole lot of other persons. Your PPE is, you know, your mask is like, you know, using a condom correctly and consistently. Um, and there's stigma. I mean, I struggle a lot as the chair of a OBGYN big clinical department. There's a lot of stigma now because people say, well, what did you do? You know, what, how did you get it? And so I think we need to avoid um, that stigma as stigmatizing people with COVID. You know, that's such an important point uh, about the stigma, but also the, the like the S S T S T I. you know, if your bubble is only four people, but somebody in your bubble has another bubble and their bubble has right. six people, you know, pretty soon your, your bubble's pretty big. Yeah, um, that actually, that, that uh, piece that I did for my kids where I said, you know, enjoy your bubble. And then not only were they upset that none of their friends were in their bubble, but then they were upset because none of our dogs were in the bubble either. So I had to amend it and say the dogs were part of the bubble. So we've got a few questions on gestational age and most of these questions focus on sort of the first trimester specifically. So does the severity of the disease correlate to the stage of pregnancy and does having a first trimester COVID infection increase your risk of preterm birth? So um, we don't know about, we don't have enough information to really sort out trimester of pregnancy and the effects in each trimester the way we have for other pathogens. Hopefully we will have more information. Um, preterm birth seems to be uh, more common among um, and this is consistent with other pathogens, among women infected later in pregnancy and who are severely ill. Um, and so it's probably this indirect effects of when, you know, mom is ill, severely ill, um, she's more likely to have a preterm birth. And we know that from lots of other infections. Great. Um, we've got some questions about the medical complications associated with COVID. So what about, are you seeing more preeclampsia, more gestational diabetes, more thromboembolism? So there's been some reports of increased preeclampsia and some reports that have not um, substantiated that. So I'm not sure. Same thing with the thrombotic disease. We really haven't seen that um, pregnant persons compared to non-pregnant persons. It hasn't been adequately examined, but we don't have um, any strong evidence currently that thromboembolic disease is more common over and above your risk from being pregnant. Okay, okay. Um, some questions about management of um, delivery. So if you've got somebody infected and ill with COVID, she's on oxygen and needs to go to the ICU, how do you weigh decisions about when she should be delivered um, the questioners hearing stories about women um, decompensating sort of as they're pushing the baby out. Yeah, it really reminds me some of, um, you know, what we saw with pandemic influenza where we had women, very severely ill women. Um, and I think you just, it, it's what we do, in a, as, as you know better than I do as being a, um, a, a maternal fetal medicine specialist, it's weighing, you know, how stable the mother is and for each individual mother, what the risk of delivery is and what the best route of delivery is. And I don't think there's one answer. Um, in general, 
um, for uh, you know, a woman uh, who is in severely ill and intubated can de safely deliver vaginally um, in many cases. So you just want to, you know, it's, a, it's an individualized clinical decision. Great. Um, we've got some questions about um, sort of maternal infection and breastfeeding. So I think you've sort of explained that uh, a breastfeeding woman can definitely get the vaccine, but what if a woman has had COVID? Do we think that then breastfeeding her baby uh, is going to protect her baby? Is anybody, um, has anybody been studying looking for IgA antibodies um, in breast milk? I've not seen any published reports. However, we know the benefits of breastfeeding are broad and we would, you would assume that there would be um, protective antibodies that would be transferred to a baby. Um, and I don't see any reason why COVID would behave differently than, or SARS-CoV-2 would behave dramatically differently than most other um, um, pathogens where the mother mounts an immune response, uh, antibody response. Okay, okay. Um, and then sort of related to that, if um, somebody has just delivered and has a newborn baby, uh, what are your recommendations as far as the bubble at that point? You know, I mean, I think prior to the pandemic, it was a time where definitely the grandparents were coming to visit or maybe an aunt and an uncle. Um, what, what's your advice there? I think until we have, until we have everybody's vaccinated, I think it's really, you have to think really carefully about who's in your bubble. And if you have a newborn baby, I think it's more, even more important to worry about who's in your bubble because every person who comes into contact with the baby is, and with you um, is potential as a nursing mother is potentially um, um, a source of infection. So I think, you know, after you take your baby home from the hospital is a really good time to limit um, who's in your bubble. And, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of people who've been very worried about the social isolation um, for postpartum women and the risk of um, increasing rates of postpartum depression. And I do think it's something we need to monitor and, and um, uh, be careful about. And think about ways, you know, think about a pregnancy plan and a postpartum plan um, to make sure that the mother is not um, as isolated. Okay, great. Um, well, the questions are still rolling in. So if you can uh, stay with us. Um, so we've got some questions about um, the so-called COVID long haulers or the people who've had kind of a chronic uh, sequelae of COVID. Um, is there any data about this in pregnancy or association with complications of pregnancy? So that's why I mentioned the priority study, because that is the best data I know of follow-up um, data collected routinely, systematically from women who are not hospitalized. Um, and what it looks like is the per symptoms persist, whether they're going to be um, categorized, fall into the category of long haulers, I don't know. But there's certainly a concerning proportion of pregnant persons who have persistent symptoms. And I think hopefully priority will continue to follow, be supported and continue to follow that cohort. And there are other cohorts as well um, to find out more about what this looks like long term. Uh, we have a question from somebody who I'm guessing works in the ICU who asked, do you have any knowledge or reports about how to best prone patients if necessary during pregnancy? And do you worry about increased risk of vascular collapse due to increased intravascular volume? So the proning is an interesting question uh, because there is some information um, that proning can help in, with COVID infection. And SMFM has a nice... Um, picture on their website of how to prone a sort of modified prone position for a pregnant patient. Um, what was the other part of your question, the second part? Um, vascular collapse due to sort of expanded pregnancy intravascular volume and decreased uh, systemic vascular resistance. So I think the, the issues of critical care in a pregnant patient are, there isn't anything dramatically different than what we normally see. Um, and so you definitely, 
you definitely want in, in addition to ICU care for a critically ill pregnant person, you also want to consult with a maternal fetal medicine specialist, which I am not. Um, and, and I have heard, uh, I'm not a big TikToker, but apparently TikTok is a source for lots of quick videos on how to do things like prone pregnant people. So oh, that's wow. one, one resource for people in the trenches. Um, so I, we've got a lot of questions in the chat about the vaccine. And I think this is really still just people, you know, you said kind of, you know, we have limited data so far, theoretically, it should be safe. Um, but I think there's still a lot of, in, you know, discomfort with it, particularly we've got some people responding saying, hey, in my job, I'm fairly low risk, whatever it is that I'm I'm doing, I'm not super high risk for getting COVID, should I get the vaccine? How, how do you answer that question? I would say at this point in the pandemic, nobody's low risk. I mean, the, the rates of infection are sky high. We are all at large risk, regardless of what we do. Um, and, so, or, and so, you know, my parents are in their mid eighties and they have been home since the middle of March and have not left their house except to go for short walks and avoid other people. They're at very low risk. Um, they need the vaccine so that they can get much needed social interaction. Um, most of us who are out and about in the world are, at, are, are not at, regardless of what our jobs are, um, we are at relatively high risk. Um, and so I don't, so I think it's really important to get vaccinated. I think the other good reason is so that we can get back to normal life and we really need herd immunity. We need enough people in the US to get vaccinated so that we can be done with this for a while or done with it forever, hopefully, um, but or nearly done with it, have it be controllable. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of people for a variety of reasons who are hesitant of the vaccine. And if you are pregnant and you're not comfortable taking the vaccine and you weigh the risks and benefits and you just, for you, it's not the right answer, we should also support pregnant women in declining the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, so, um, and the other question that comes up is, can my workplace mandate me to get vaccinated? My understanding that unlike flu, we cannot because it's under an EUA, as long as it's an, under an EUA, um, no one can be um, forced to get vaccinated as a, um, uh, uh, um, a requirement for their job. Are there any people, say, who have um, certain kinds of immunodeficiencies or allergy histories that you would, based on their medical history, recommend them they not get the vaccine? Yeah, there are groups who should not be uh, vaccinated um, and ACE, that's one of the reasons for ACIP very specifically outlines which groups cannot get vaccinated. If you've had anaphylaxis to any of the components of the vaccine, um, you should not get vaccinated. If you are, um, uh, have an autoimmune disease, you can get vaccinated. So there are, very, there are a few contraindications to vaccine and they are listed um, um, in the ACIP materials. Okay, um, they're still coming in. So with the UK reporting a new strain of COVID-19, do you think the vaccine will be effective here? Um, I do not know. I have not seen, I did not, uh, I've not seen how uh, different the strain is in the UK and I don't know about the safety and e efficacy of okay. the vaccine. And while we're on sort of the biologics of the vaccine, uh, one person asked, is there any concern that the fetus's immune system would identify the spike protein as a self-antigen? So based on what we know about the vaccine, it should, the spike protein um, is similar to the COVID spike protein. And we know that um, there is very little transplacental transmission, but there's no reason that the um, the spike protein, that's, which is a small component um, of the COVID spike protein, would be um, problematic to the fetus. Um, so there are two concerns. There, there have been raised two concerns that I've heard about the vaccine. One is that the um, mRNA is going to, the you know, 
nanoparticle with the mRNA is going to cross the placenta. As I said, that's very unlikely given how the vaccine works. It's a local um, mechanism of action. It's not systemic. So you'd have to get, you'd have to escape the lymphatic system. You'd have to get in the circulation. Then it would have to get across the placenta and get to the fetus. It's possible. There's apparently um, an, in a study of that I can't find. So if anybody knows of it, please send it to me. There's apparently a influenza vaccine study that shows that the vaccine can cross the placenta and get into the placenta and into cord blood um, from de several decades ago. Um, but again, we know that the we have decades of um, uh, experience with influenza vaccine um, and we know it's very safe in pregnancy. In fact, um, my fun fact is, um, do you know what year um, the uh, public health service, the Surgeon General, first recommended that pregnant women received influenza vaccine. Any idea? 1960. Wow. So we've been giving flu vaccine to pregnant women for a long time. Um, is, um, so the MRA, mRNA is injected into the muscle and then the muscle cells machinery generates that fragment of the spike protein. Is that fragment of the spike protein then um, released into a person's bloodstream where the immune system interacts with it? Or does the immune system um, enter the cells and interact in that way? So um, I'm not a vaccine expert. So I will just say that my knowledge is limited but it produces a local immune reaction and then production of antibodies, um, which help systemic antibodies, which then help protect, provide protection, long lasting, well, moderately, we don't know how long lasting, but you know, relatively long lasting protection, um, immune protection from SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Have you seen any research about um, you know, the risk of sort of preterm birth and pregnancy complications, is any of that been associated with either women who are undocumented, who've been afraid to seek prenatal care, or women who, um, you know, may well be U.S. citizens, but don't have health insurance coverage and so aren't getting the medical care that they need? Are any of these things being associated with some of the complications? So there are uh... So I'm not sure I have the information to answer that. So um, the studies that show or don't show a risk of preterm birth are among women who are in the hospital identified as being COVID positive. Um, and then we have birth outcomes from them. And then you compare them to either a, a contemporary group who's also delivering and doesn't have COVID or historical controls or, or baseline rate of preterm birth. So, um, I think the larger question is, are we seeing an overall increase, decrease, or no change in preterm birth doing, due to the lockdowns? And I think that's more, um, more along the lines of what other factors could be associated with um, uh, reluctance to come to the hospital. But I don't think at least, so anecdotally, I don't, I don't know that there's been an increase due to those other factors and coming in late. What are you recommending in the time of COVID for pregnant women as far as um, certain types of preventative health care, say dental care, um, that you would normally, you know, outside of COVID say, yes, you should do this while you're pregnant. Um, I mean, obviously, if you normally would say don't do it, then presumably you're going to say don't do it with COVID. But what would you say about things like going to the dentist while pregnant during COVID? Interesting you picked up dentistry because that one I'm going to have, have a little bit of um, concern about. But in general, I think we have figured out during COVID how to safely deliver in-person care. And there hasn't been the uh, knock on wood, hasn't, there haven't been a lot of um, uh, infections in healthcare settings that are taking appropriate precautions. So I think it's safe to get prenatal care visits as long as hospital systems and, and physicians offices are doing what they need to do, socially distancing, not having people in the waiting room, staggering appointments, cleaning between, universal masking, 
you know, doing all the things that they should be doing. So I don't think it's a reason to skip preventive, important preventive care. The issue that we're seeing is with the hospital beds and intensive care units filling up. It might not be, time, it is not time right now to do elective inpatient procedures, pregnant or non-pregnant. Um, dental care is a little tricky because it's hard because, you know, dental care requires you to open your mouth. Um, uh, although I have to say there haven't been um, uh, uh, outbreaks that I've heard about that are specifically related to uh, dental offices. Um, the other issue is telehealth. Can you do telehealth? There are some nice models out of Mayo Clinic, um, even outside of COVID, that show that, that some of what we do in prenatal care probably doesn't need to be done in person. It probably can be done with a home um, blood pressure cuff and a fetal heart rate monitor um, to document heart tones and telehealth. I think we've all learned a lot about how, how well telehealth works for appropriate types of visits. Thank you. Um, do you have any uh, information on the Chinese-made vaccine Sinopharm? I really don't. Really, I've been so focused on the U.S. vaccines, I really have not been following. Um, one interesting thought about vaccines in other countries, the Pfizer vaccine, particularly in other countries, UK came out and said that pregnant women, uh, pregnancy was a contraindication to vaccine, and I believe they're still not vaccinating pregnant women. Um, uh, Canada, uh, by contrast, is giving the vaccine, started giving the vaccine to pregnant women. Okay. Um, do you have any um, recommendations for um, outpatient care um, and uh, uh, things like baby aspirin to decrease the risk of blood clots or should pregnant women have an oxygen monitor at home? Yeah, I, my feeling is that um, I don't think, I think we should care for pregnant women in the same way we care for non-pregnant women with COVID. Um, except where there's a compelling reason to do something different. Um, and I don't see any of those as having compelling evidence at this point to do anything different. Okay. Um, we've got a couple questions uh, from uh, providers who care for pregnant women. So I think people are wondering if, um, if the labor and delivery suite acts like an emergency room, should those providers be considered frontline providers and be in an early wave of vaccination? Boy, that's, um, from my perspective, absolutely. I think that labor and delivery units are unpredictable settings where we have, um, depending on where you are in the pandemic, there are lots of COVID infected patients. We can't cohort them. We can't put them in most cases we can't delay their, you know, delivery. We can't delay their procedure. It's not elect. Having a baby is not elective when you go into labor. Um, so uh, it's unpredictable in that, um, you know, we're running around trying to uh, get women, have women deliver. It's hard for a woman to wear a mask consistently while she's pushing. We know that labor, um, I won't get into the whole aerosolizing thing, but we know that during pushing, there's a lot of droplets and a lot of respiratory um, droplets that are in the environment. Um, we sometimes have to intubate unexpectedly for C-sections. Um, and so I think that labor and delivery providers should get vaccine, should be near the top of the list. Um, I think it's a lot riskier than working, for example, in a COVID unit where everyone's, you know, intubated, or if you're going to do an intubation, you know, you know, you, you, know, you can plan for that. Um, so I, I don't understand why, for example, in many health systems, we are not near the top of the list. I don't know if it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is we do and how we do it. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm very frustrated with that. Um, it looks like we're getting to the top of the hour. I think we can stay on for a couple minutes uh, to get to a couple more questions. Um, is that okay, Dr. Jameson, Dr. Yes. Wax? 
Yeah, that would be great. I, I think, uh, Doctor, and you know, thank you so much for a wonderful, uh, you know, Q and A. Uh, these questions have been uh, fantastic, and and the the pre presentation uh, was uh, you know truly outstanding. Um, I think Dr. Kazi has uh, several questions, and uh, I have one remaining question as well. Thank you. I just want to I'll uh, condense it a little bit. Dr. Jameson, you mentioned that um, the fact that pregnant women receive the vaccine during the clinical trials is not unusual. Can you provide some more details on that? Yeah, so often what happens is the pregnancy is not recognized at the time she's enrolled in the vaccine trial. So it's too early in pregnancy or pregnancy test is not positive um, and she's pregnant or she gets pregnant during the trial. So for example, between the first and the second dose. Thank you. Yeah. Now, ACM, and ACMT is currently conducting some surveillance for adverse events from COVID-19 therapeutics. Are there any therapies for COVID-19 that concern you uh, if used in pregnant women? So I think it's just like most of what we do in obstetrics, it's weighing the risks and benefits and what we know about the um, treatment versus the risks of doing nothing. And in general, the principle is don't withhold an effective treatment from a pregnant woman unless you have a really compelling reason to do so. Um, because the pregnant women should receive, you know, if the pregnant woman doesn't do well, her baby's not going to do well. And so, for example, for most of the, you know, for monoclonal, for monoclonal antibodies, we've been using those in pregnancy. There's no theoretical reason to be concerned about their use in pregnancy. Um, so it, for the most part, most interventions should be used in critically ill pregnant women, the same as they're used in critically ill non-pregnant persons as long as you don't have a compelling reason to change your care. And then I'll, my last question, uh, some of our colleagues are using N95s, others are using uh, different types of respirators, those air purifying respirators called PAPRs when they're working. Would those pose a stress on a, um, on a pregnant woman's baby? So the um, PAPRs can be uncomfortable in pregnancy and constraining in pregnancy. And so during Ebola, we there was sort of a move to say that, you know, if pregnant women don't have to wear pappers, it might, it might be a good idea. Um, the N95, um, I mean, they're uncomfortable when worn all day. There's some study, you know, there were some interesting studies that were done that looked at oxygenation levels using N95 uh, masks. But as long as a woman can work comfortably, which many pregnant women are working with N95s, I don't have reason to be concerned. Since uh, we went through our questions quickly, I have one more question. If you were to do this again, would you, what would you change with our uh, research uh, you know, readiness in, for pregnant women in a, in a pandemic? That's a great question. So we need more uh, um, investment in surveillance, public health surveillance systems nationally. And we need public health surveillance systems that focus on pregnant women. Those surveillance systems should live at the CDC. They should be nation, nationwide. You know, you looked at what the UK did. They very quickly got their, you know, hibernated surveillance system up and running. Um, and you look at priority. I mean, Vanessa Jacoby at UCSF called me very early in the pandemic and laid out exactly what she wanted to do. And that was precisely what CDC should have had been ready. Um, I said, you know, I'll do whatever I can do to help you because this is exactly what has to happen. And unfortunately, our, our very talented and skilled um, colleagues at the CDC do not have the resources and support that they need to do their job well. They know exactly what they need to do. There are really skilled epidemiologists at the CDC um, who know all about pregnancy surveillance. Just give them the time and the money to be able to set things up properly so that when we hit the next pandemic um, or the next major outbreak, that they're ready. I support you wholeheartedly on this, uh, this topic. Dr. Wax, I'll leave it up to you to uh, conclude. Great. Well, thank you again. Uh, thanks to you know both our speaker and our moderator. Uh, two final questions. The first one um, is about uh, um, you know prenatal care and the impact uh, on COVID nineteen. Uh, we know from our cardiology and neurology colleagues that um, uh, treatment for uh, patients coming in for treatment for heart attack and for stroke, you know, fell way off, you know, particularly in the in the spring, uh, with potentially deleterious uh, consequences. Um, what sort of impact on uh, 
pregnant women getting routine uh, uh, prenatal care have you seen? And, and has that had any uh, consequence? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. It's certainly not as dramatic as the de delays in care that we've seen in other areas. I think we, at least here in our practice, we figured out fairly quickly how to deliver prenatal care safely. I think a number of health systems decreased the, the um, number of prenatal, we did uh, pre decrease the number of pre pre recommended prenatal visits. And I think it's a testament to the fact that um, you know, it's probably important to document heart tones and it's really important to document blood pressure but a lot of that we can do remotely. So I don't think we've seen the same um, delays in care. Um, and I think also women, it seemed anecdotally, it seems that women are coming into triage and coming in for pregnancy complaints, um, regardless of the pandemic. And I think part of that was too, we very quickly said, you know, no visitors and, you know, we're gonna make this space safe. And I think, I think that word got out. Great, thank you. And, and then finally, uh, one of your earlier slides was it was so interesting. Uh, the European data about uh, you know decreased uh, very early preterm uh, babies uh, not reproduced in, in the Philadelphia uh, studies. But do you have any you know further thoughts about that? It, you'd mentioned that you know this has been one of the great challenges for for many many decades to get, to get to uh, a place where uh, there would be a decrease in, in very early preterm labor. Um, any further thoughts about uh, what was observed in, in Europe? It's really intriguing. I mean, when it was one country, I was like, oh, it's got to be a fluke. And then it was two, and then it was three, and it was fairly substantial declines. So I am, my area of re research is not specifically on preterm birth, but boy, there's something there. Um, and it's really puzzling um, why there would be a dramatic decline in preterm birth. And then the explanations were, you know, decreased stress and I'm thinking here, there's not decreased stress, there's increased financial stress and increased, you know, and I don't know whether it's, you know, is it environmental? Is it, um, you know, women are less likely to get other um, viral infections because they're not out and about? I don't know. It's really intriguing. Yeah, very much it so. It certainly seems that the places that have reported that are all countries that have good sort of social safety nets so that the, you know, the women that are staying at home are staying at home and they have money to feed themselves and their family and they're not, um, you know, I think here in the United States for people who aren't, you know, who aren't employed in jobs where they are telecommuting and can stay at home, those essential workers, you know, they're making this really hard choice. Do I continue to go to work and potentially get exposed to this virus? or do I stay home and, and not feed my family? And so that's obviously gonna be a very stressful decision. And I, and I bet it's gonna turn out that that's a big part of it. Yeah, it'd be nice um, support for providing a better uh, safety net in the US. Well, uh, it's certainly a, a silver lining to this awful, awful pandemic is all the knowledge we're learning um, that will hopefully have a very positive impact for the future. Um, so on that note, uh, I'd like to thank our speaker again. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, coming up uh, after a short break over the holidays is uh, uh, a uh, presentation about vaccine distribution. We're, we're really uh, thrilled to have uh, Dr. Satish apply from um, from CDC. He's a senior liaison to Operation Warp Speed and the COVID-19 uh, Vaccine Task Force. And he'll be speaking uh, uh, on January 6th at 3 p.m. during our, our usual uh, COVID webinar series uh, after the holidays. Uh, next slide. So um, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be up on our website. Uh, all the registrants will get an email about this on, uh, on Friday. And uh, we also will have a couple of feedback questions. Uh, feel free to send in your comments about uh, this webinar series. We've been really delighted to uh, be able to provide this uh, webinar series uh, uh, this year uh, as a way of getting out important information and, and have been very fortunate to have an outstanding uh, array of, of uh, national and international experts like Dr. Jameson, you know, provide everyone with this very timely information. Uh, all this information regarding our, our prior webinars as well as the upcoming webinars can be found on our, our prospectus on our website at uh, acmt.net forward slash COVID-19 uh, web. I, I wish everyone, uh, uh, safe uh, uh, and um, um, happy holidays uh, in this very uh, distressed time. I think uh, it's gratifying 
to know that uh, the vaccine uh, is now uh, out. It will be a while still before everyone has access to the vaccine. So uh, please uh, stay safe, uh, observe all the social distancing, uh, public health uh, uh, recommendations and, and have a, a good holiday. Uh, thank you very much and good day.